Hi everyone, I'm Jack Thremling, Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share a few thoughts about the best work of nonfiction I've read this year. It's a book I absolutely loved reading. It's a book I was excited about when I heard it was coming out. And it's one that I'm excited to go back to once I've had some time to go spend some time with the text the author was uh, writing about and referencing and quoting throughout his work. Uh, it's The Rigor of Angels by William Eginton. And it is a book in which Eginton uh, examines what he refers to as metaphysical prejudice. This idea that uh, humans, it's a tendency we all have, want to take our uh, observations, our experiences, our relationships, our interactions, and put them together into this sort of puzzle that, that allows us to, in a sense, glimpse the objective reality of the universe that we inhabit. Uh, and, and even though there are pieces missing in that puzzle, we think, okay, we can, we can sort of gloss those over and fill in the blanks. Uh, and Eginton questions our ability to do that. And in doing so, he also questions uh, certain assumptions that we've made, assumptions around uh, concepts of infinity, concepts around eternal space, concepts around time, most crucially at the end, uh, concepts around free will and its existence or absence. It's absolutely fascinating. It's so fluidly written. It's humorously written. Uh, and it's so authentic. It's clear. Eginton says in the acknowledgments, he spent over 20 years thinking about these ideas and really developing the ideas for this book. Uh, and, and that labor of love shows here. This is an absolute masterpiece. I cannot recommend it highly enough. But what is he getting at? Well, he, he wants to examine how Kant in the 18th century, uh, through his, his uh, philosophical questions and metaphysical questions, uh, primarily uh, raised in, in the three famous critiques. Uh, then later on, Werner Heisenberg with um, quantum physics and the uncertainty principles uh, in the early 20th century. And finally, Jorge Luis Borges in his uh, both nonfiction and fiction across the uh, early and, and middle of the 20th century would question um, each of these ideas. He divides the book across four sections, which says, okay, these are four sort of crucial questions, what he calls antinomies, these, these seeming paradoxes that exist. Uh, and he looks at how each of those thinkers had some, uh, you know, question or, uh, you know, development in that area. And so the, the book is really quite fascinating. It, it's organized with each chapter being roughly 20 pages. So you can sit and, and, and spend a deep, you know, 30 minutes reading and then an hour thinking about this before continuing on to the next chapter. Uh, but it's a propulsive experience to read it. And um, it, it's really a, a joyful experience to read because of the way that Eginton is will, willing to sort of um, imbue the, these characters with humanity. Even Heisenberg, uh, who in the 1930s and 1940s takes a very dark, horrifying turn, if you know, you know the history of Europe and, and the world in, during that time, um, he, he looks to uh, see the, the humanity behind each of these choices and ultimately, you know, he doesn't necessarily absolve Heisenberg of working in, in the uh, nuclear program under Nazi Germany. But uh, he's, he's constantly questing um, to, to peer at the heart of their identities, their realities, even as he's examining what, what that is for us, the uncertainty that we must experience. Uh, so I wanted to give a sense of his writing, to give a sense of, of what this book reads like, because he does deal with very, very complex ideas, um, but he also uh, does it in a way that can be very humorous. <laughs> so for example, here he is talking about Heisenberg thinking his way through things. Uh, One clear day, as they walked through the hill country to the west of Lake Starnberg, they pushed through a clearing in the trees that revealed to them the expanse of the lake as it stretched to the mountains beyond. It was on this day, Heisenberg would later recall, that his desire to understand the natural world right down to the level of its constituent parts was born. The group had read many of the, of the same books, works of Kant figured along with those of classical philosophy, and his influence seeped in as well. As they bantered away, free for a moment from the maelstrom in the city below, Heisenberg began to grasp a concept that would be decisive for his later work as a physicist. When we explore the natural world, we don't see things directly as they are in themselves, but translate them first into mental images and then finally into concepts. It is only when we have filtered our bare impressions through concepts that we can say we have experienced them. Concepts were words, of course, and words were what flowed back and forth in dialogues. Each dialogue could only take place within a group of at least two members. No one on his or her own owned the truth. 
but truth could emerge slowly from the negotiation between the participants in the conversation. What one needed to look for was something not available to any individual on his or her own. Heisenberg thought of this as the middle ground, a place where truth emerged from the relation between elements as opposed to residing in any one of them. <coughs> uh, later on, in another passage, he, uh, to, to give sort of a sense of, of the humor <laughs> that um, Eggington is capable of, he's exploring uh, the, this concept of, of a universe and, and an, infin, an infinite universe uh, that upon gazing outward, one gazes actually inward to some or original point and what that means for time and our conception of the universe. What could it mean to look out at the night sky or any sky for that matter and feel that we are looking in? To do this, we might begin by imagining the surface of the earth on which we stand is not curved convexly, bending away from the soles of our feet, but rather concavely, like the inside of a bowl, such that way out there, beyond any visible horizon, the earth's surface slopes gently up to eventually encompass everything we see. In this inverted cosmos, no matter where we stand on the surface of the earth, we could stare straight up and point toward the exact same point. But even if we could manage to twist our minds around this way, we would surely be tempted to wonder why anyone would concoct such a bizarre cosmic architecture. The reason medievals did so stemmed from a long-standing debate about what it meant for the cosmos to be somewhere at all. And so he goes on on a subsequent page <laughs> Uh, to describe how um, various thinkers across the Middle Ages and then into the 20th century uh, had wrestled with this and Dante's influence on it. <clears throat> Even Ruchid's model, while not fully adopted by the theologians, had remarkable staying power. It was the model C.S. Lewis had in mind when he tried to reorient his students to medieval ways of viewing the heavens. Although Lewis had his version not from Ibn Rushd, but from its adaptation by Dante, as he wrote in the discarded image, a few astonishing lines from the Berardiso stamp this image on my mind forever. The universe is thus, when our minds are sufficiently freed from the senses, turned inside out. The Italian poet's divine comedy recounts in first person the mystical journey of his alter ego through the gates of hell, down through its nine circles to the lowest point of creation, literally the nether parts of Lucifer, buried upside down in ice. From the nadir of creation that is Satan's scrotum, the poet describes ascending to the surface of the earth, up the mountain of purgatory, and from there begins in the third book his ascent to the pinnacle of paradise. Improbably, bewilderingly, Dante managed to inscribe in his journey the model of a cosmos whose center is its own container. <clears throat> and where Eggington goes with that is to <laughs> describe the idea that when we've looked into the night sky, we see far, far in the distance, uh, beyond the stars and such, the cosmic microwave background radiation that seems to be from the origin of the universe, that no matter where we look from in the in our universe, far enough out, what we would see on the edge is something from the beginning of time. Uh, and, and what he is very uh, fascinated in doing is, is helping pick apart some of the logical fallacies that exist when we think about something being outside of time or outside of space or... Uh, at the edge of infinity. Uh, as I said, at the end, he goes into an absolutely fascinating 60-page uh, series of, of questions and contemplations on the concept of free will. And it is it's honestly one of the best uh, discussions on free will that I have encountered in a lifetime of reading. I, I will remember many of his images, uh, the, the paradoxes he, he conjures up, and the way that Eggington tries to resolve these through through the minds of Borges, Kant, and Heisenberg, um, they're, they're truly fantastic. They're on a par with some of the ideas uh, and, and the, the way that um, Augustine wrestles with some of the same conceptions. I, I really, really enjoyed this. So briefly, uh, the, four, uh, the, the four concepts, one is this idea around um, the, the concept that observation requires a distance that in order to observe something you you have to reckon that it was at one point in time and then at another point in time which means that you have some distant remove from those even though it might be microscopic and what that would mean he explores um, what it would mean if we could not forget anything that would mean we were spending all time inhabiting this and thus unable to interact uh, with the universe he examines what it means with 
um, what then from, the, from that concept of time, what it would mean in terms of omniscience. Uh, and then he examines concepts around infinity and this edge of, of eternity <coughs> and, and sort of this idea of an absolute um, that, ex that we are able to reference within our efforts uh, to determine a reality. And then finally, these concepts around free will. And it's just astonishing. I cannot encourage you highly enough to go read this book. Um, perhaps it is not a book for everybody, but it was definitely a book for Jack. Now, uh, as I said, the primary sources, well, they're, they're manifold. Uh, one would, of course, be Kant. Um, I would recommend grabbing something like this basic writings of Kant rather than going and grabbing the full 700-ish page uh, critique of pure reason. Um, the the uh the critiques can be quite long this part specifically the the, the critiques of, of pure reason and practical reason are, are quite long um the critique of judgment is is not quite as intensive and, and acts as a nice summing up but i would say start with something like this for kant rather than going and grabbing that and if you do find a digital copy <laughs> Um, with Heisenberg, Heisenberg, some of his writings were collected in a, a work he wrote called Physics and Philosophy, The Revolution in Modern Science. And this allows Heisenberg to sort of have his take on the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum uh, particles. Um, Einstein comes in for in great detail, Niels Bohr, Max Born, uh, a number of others. At the very end of the book where um, uh, Eginton allows each of the individuals from history that he the thinkers he has been following to sort of have this crucible moment where they have a choice to to you know stand by stand for what's right or or take a different choice he examines the choice each of the three made and he examines what would that mean uh in a sense in the garden of forking paths of borges's story uh what if you know this is a fork they chose what does it mean that they did not choose the other uh, what, what does that mean about concepts around a multiverse and such? Um, but this allows Heisenberg to have his word. Um, he also, uh, if you're really interested in quantum, <laughs> quantum physics, the probably one of the best works on it the, for primary sources in anthology is The Dreams That Stuff Is Made Of, which was an anthology edited by Stephen Hawking, and it includes a huge number of um, primary sources and and. Uh, passages from from the original papers that were given by thinkers like Bohr, um, Dirac, Heisenberg, uh, Wolfgang Pauli, and, and so many others. <clears throat> Schrodinger as well. Um, then of course there's the great Borges. Not only his fiction uh, and several stories are, are you know they're they're not so much spoiled as. What uh, Eginton does is he examines how Borges explores our conception of reality in the universe through his story. What are the ideas that are present here, such as the Library of Babel, the idea that um, if every hexagon, every hexagonal room is the same, well, we could calculate what would the we know how many books there could actually be in the library. How big would this library have to be? How does our size of the universe compare? Um, and then, you know, what would its shape be? Uh, does it perhaps resemble hypersphere? <laughs> That's sort of a special type of sphere. You can look it up. Um, but he also goes into some of Borges's uh, nonfiction, his essays, how Borges was examining some of those ideas through nonfiction uh, and, and hypothesizing some really fascinating ideas. Uh, and I, I think it's wonderful to see how uh, different aspects of human thought can converge on this same fascinating idea. Additionally, though, he mentions in great detail Zeno. Uh, Parmenides comes in for a very slight mention, but Zeno gets gets his day. Uh, Dante, as I had already mentioned, is is brought in. Um, Brian Green comes in, and and uh, I, certainly if you're fascinating in string theory and you want a good book, The Elegant Universe is one of the best. Um, it does not prove string theory. Um, and I think it perhaps, Green has a tendency along with other string theorists to want to shoehorn some things in. Uh, but the one I would really recommend from Ryan Green is The Hidden Reality. This is just a fascinating book that explores concepts of a multiverse, something that Eginton explores with um, his, 
his questions around the uncertainty principle, the idea that when the fork occurs, are there now parallel universes that set up that have both occurrences and um, what that might mean for free will or a lack thereof. Uh, and then fine. And he goes into, Egnan goes into describe some of the issues with uh, green statements. Uh, Nietzsche, specifically in the spoke Zarathustra, is brought in. <laughs> of course, Aristotle with his physics has to be here. Uh, and the deep influence he exerted on so many. Uh, Plato and Socrates uh, are, are brought in. The, the idea is Heisenberg had, had was deeply influenced by Plato's and Socrates' theory of forms and the idea of the geometric shapes and how that influenced the uncertainty principle. And then finally, I think one of the few books I was thinking of that, that I thought just examined um, deep concepts in such a fluid, readable, accessible way uh, was Umberto Eco's The Infinity of Lists, one of the best works of nonfiction I read a couple of years ago. I read this in 2020, and I was just blown away by what this book entailed. And it's one that I also want to go reread and, and think about um, just because of how it's amazing to see how great minds really do grapple with some of the most abstract uh, concepts and yet most crucial concepts that we uh, experience in our lives. And so let me know if you've read this one. As I said, this is The Rigor of Angels, Borges, Heisenberg, Kant, and the Ultimate Nature of Reality by William Eginton. And I hope everybody's doing well. Thank you.